121, Overcoming Drug Addiction by Faith, by Rev. Burton Barr, Jr. Audiobook available on Audible and iTunes. Paperback and ebook available on Amazon.com. You know, but I always try to do things my way. I try to do it without God's help. I thought I could do it on my own, but it seemed like every time I took one step forward, I would trip and end up taking two steps back. But I was still determined that I was gonna do this thing my way. You see, because I wanted my part of this thing that they call the American dream. You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the cars, the clothes, the house, the bling, and everything that went with it. And I was gonna do it, and I was gonna scratch my way up, even if I had to do it with my own bare hands. But every time I I tried, it seemed like these same two hands would end up back in handcuffs. And I would be back in the Cook County Jail in Chicago on my knees and crying out to God, asking him to deliver me yet again. I always knew I was going to be a preacher when I was a little child, I think nine, ten years old. Um, I had a uh, my own church in my mother's uh, kitchen, uh, and my my brother, my little brother, and my dog Rex, they were my two church members. Um, my brother uh, didn't wasn't all that happy about it. He wanted to go outside and play, but uh, I was bigger than him, so I threatened him. He had to sit there and listen to me preach all the time, every every week. But then uh, what happened was, I know that when I was about 16 years old, uh, I was on my way home from school. Um, and I remember that uh, even when I was younger, my, I told my mother I was going to be a preacher. And she had told me I couldn't just decide that I was going to uh, be a preacher. She told me that God had to call me. And so uh, for the next few days, I sat around the phone waiting for God to call. But when I was 16 years old, I, I remember I was on my way home from school and on, on the bus, and I kind of was sitting there, uh, kind of dozing or whatever. But now I remember uh, I just saw myself preaching and preaching and preaching, and it felt different that time. And I was thinking that that, that was God really calling me at that time. And uh, I talked with my father, who was a, a, a preacher. I talked with my pastor. I talked with my aunt, who was also a preacher. And then. Uh, uh, that was when I decided, and we all decided that um, uh, that that I should uh, go ahead on and preach my trial sermon. I left the church because I was kind of disillusioned. Um, I was I had a different opinion uh, or a set opinion of how I thought a preacher was supposed to be, and how church members were supposed to be, and and how church itself was uh, supposed to be, and 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 I wasn't seeing that. Uh, uh, in, in my opinion, that the, the preachers weren't as holy as, as I thought they should be, and a lot of the church members were not acting as holy as I thought they should be. I was, uh, I, I guess, I was looking for the, the perfect, uh, uh, the perfect preacher or the perfect church member or the perfect church. Uh, I went from one denomination to another, uh, thinking that one might be better than the other. But I found out later on that um, there is no such thing as a perfect preacher or a perfect church or a perfect anything else. There was only one perfect person in the world, that was Jesus. And so the, the, the illusion that I had in my head that there, there just isn't any. Um, and so, uh, but I discovered that uh, afterwards, after I'd already left the church, was that uh, we're all flawed. Uh, I was 20 years old. It was shortly after I left church, I started drinking and uh, started smoking marijuana uh, with some of my friends. Uh, I would drop a few pills uh, from time to time, uh, reds, uh, trees, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then one time, so one time, a friend of mine came by with some uh, with drugs. It was a street name of Doogee. I didn't know it at the time, but uh, Doogee was really heroin. Uh, several friends came by. It was on a Friday evening, 
uh, and they had the, the doji or heroin, uh, but they also uh, had some other drug paraphernalia. They had uh, needles and uh, makeshift syringes, which, uh, uh, and they were uh, getting everything together, and I asked what was going on, and they said, well, we're going to shoot it this time. I told them, well, just put mine a little bit over there for me, and uh, I'll snort mine. But then uh, my friend said, uh, no, you don't understand. we shooting ours, and you're going to shoot yours, too. And I didn't realize it at the time, but uh, B.B. and Ronnie had come up behind me, and then they grabbed me and was holding me down when my friend Tadpole was coming toward me with the, uh, with the needle and the makeshift syringe. And he said, uh, I remember saying, sorry, boy, but I know that this is the only way I can get you to try it. And by the way, that was my nickname at the time, Bub. Uh, and so when Tapol started to stick the needle in my arm, uh, I was I was struggling and resisting. And he said, hey man, you need to uh, quit struggling. The needle's gonna break in your arm. And so I quit struggling, I just stopped. And I was thinking to myself that, okay, when when this is over with, I'm going to get my, my gun uh, and I'm gonna shoot all three of them. But then when the, the um, uh, heroin started going through my system. It was a feeling of euphoria, a feeling that I'd never felt before, and that was the beginning of my drug use, on hard drugs anyway. It was uh, um, a feeling I'd never had before. Um, heroin has you kind of mellowed out. You are, uh, you 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 are just laid back and relaxed, and, and and it seems like nothing in the world that's going on matters. Uh, you do if you if you listen to uh, music like I, I I was always listening to jazz. Uh, uh, the, the the music sounded better. The the the, the saxophone that that uh, was being played, uh, it, it sounded better. The piano, whatever, all the music was just just great. You hear it differently when you were high, uh, and you just mellowed out. Just mellowed out. Uh, it was unlike any other drug that I had ever ever had. Cocaine was, like I said, the opposite. Once you, when you finish shooting some cocaine, uh, you want to go back and get some more right then. Uh, I remember sometimes when, when, when I, I, even the first time that I shot some cocaine, the, um, uh, while the, the needle was still in my arm, uh, I was, I used my other hand to uh, reach in my pocket to see how much money I had left so I can go back and get some more. But that's the effect and the difference that cocaine has. Um, it, it's an it's a, it's a instant high. Uh, it's a, a high that you really like feeling, but you want to go back and get some more right away. And then again, and again. And that's why people, some people be on benches where they do, do cocaine uh, three or four days in a row, just, just getting high all day and all night for several days and several nights. I shot both. Uh, I was uh, I started off snorting uh, heroin, and then I went to shooting heroin. Uh, and then when I started on cocaine, uh, I started uh, well, uh, I started shooting cocaine. Uh, that was when I was really into my drugs. I remember back earlier uh, when I was back in, in, in service. When I uh, well, um, when I was back in the service, uh, uh, I would snort cocaine then, but then. Uh, uh, when I started into my uh, heavy addiction, you know, I was shooting cocaine. Matter of fact, some people even do what they call speedballing. They mix the whole cocaine and heroin together and they shoot it together because it gives them the, the uh, combined effect. Uh, and that was one thing that I really loved to do was uh, speedball, shooting the heroin and cocaine together. Uh, after thinking back on things, uh, there was an emptiness there that I, I, I didn't realize uh, at the time, but there was an emptiness, I guess, an uh, emptiness or a void that I was trying to fill. Um, but mostly what I, 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 I think was uh, I was always chasing something. Uh, I don't know what it was. Uh, a lot of addicts are chasing something, and, and they, they, they don't know what it is. Uh, the best way to describe it is uh, um, when I was in prison, I had a, a recurring dream. Uh, in that dream, and, 
uh, in that dream I would uh, I would be just about to shoot some some drugs, heroin or cocaine or both, and I have the the, the, the uh, tie or belt or whatever tied around my arm, and I I was just about to stick the needle in my arm and I would wake up, and this happened again and again and again, night after night, you know, two or three, sometimes two or three nights a week, I would have that same dream, and and, and one time it got went even further, I got, got the needle into my arm, but as I was about to push the plunger. I wake up, I woke up, and, and, and I was wondering, okay, what is up with this? How come, I said, Lord, at least let me feel it one time, you know, but anyway, um, but that, 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 that's, that's um, uh, a way of describing what, the way, what you are chasing. Uh, you don't know what you're chasing, but you're chasing something. And the thing is, you never, you never catch it, you never achieve it, and so you get more drugs still chasing whoever that was. Um, and, and, and what I, I think, you know, looking back on stuff, what I'm thinking is that I didn't realize it at the time, and a lot of ad addicts don't realize it, but what they were really chasing is death. Not saying that they want to die, they try to die, but if they keep chasing what is staying away from them, what is one step ahead of, of them is, is death. But they're still chasing it. And the problem is, the bad thing is, now, too many of our people are catching up with him. They're no longer just chasing them. They caught him, and now they're dead. About two weeks ago, I left the ministry, slacking a little bit in my Persistence towards God when I was praying, you know what I'm saying? I started taking my eyes off him and started putting it all about me. It was all about me, all of a sudden. You know, so anyway, you know, I felt bad. You know, when I left, I went out and used, you know, only been out a week. You know what I mean? He came back, you know what I mean? He came back to my senses. And what I wanted to give God the glory for when I was out there, I mean, it's just like people say, once you leave the drug, uh, alone and then you go back to it, it gets worse. 3.45 in the morning, pitch dark, money all in my pocket, over 300 something dollars in my pocket. I'm out walking, I'm like, I'm like, every now and then a car passed, I'm like thinking to myself, oh God, help me God. Oh Lord God, please don't let nobody pull up and blow my head off. Oh, please don't have nobody pull up and try to rob me. You know, that's just how much God loves me. You know what I'm saying? Today, because, I mean, there's been situations like that where you hear about it on the news or, you know, whatever you want to say, you know, things like that happen to people. And, uh, all my life, I've always felt God's hand on me. So since I've been back, I've been, you know what I mean? Taking my eyes off myself, you know what I'm saying? Uh, just coming to the Lord faithfully, just taking one day at a time. I knew I was in too deep when I started doing things that I really said I would never do. I would start stealing from the church, uh, 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 particularly my, my, my father and my aunt's church. Uh, I saw my father's tithe envelope that he had dropped off uh, at, at my aunt's to put in the offering the next day. Uh, and I was... Uh, uh, what they they call fiending, you know, I was needing some drugs right then, and so I took the uh, the money uh, out of my father's uh, tithe envelope, and I went and brought drugs with it. Um, I was running, I I I I'd found uh, the checkbook, uh, 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 the church's checkbook, and I was writing checks to myself uh, from the church's checkbook. And I was signing uh, fictitious names to them, and, and so I was uh, uh, doing that. And so that's what I meant when I was stealing from the church. Um, and uh, another thing that really hurt, I know my family, my aunt, was that, okay, my aunt, who really loved me, there's pictures of, of her holding me when I was a baby, and I remember her taking me to, to, to she was a nurse. Uh, by the way, she didn't, didn't have any children. She considered me her child. Uh, and she loved me with her whole heart, and I, uh, uh, 
uh, I stole so much stuff from her that uh, 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 they were prosperous, but by the time I finished, she couldn't even have to, her electric was turned off, her gas was turned off, and the telephone was turned off because I stole, I stole all of her stuff. She had taken me in after her husband had passed uh, to help her around the house, and I, I, I was uh, I was still in her blind. I, uh, a, a, a lot of stuff that she had accumulated, I was I was selling. She had a couple of fur coats. I sold both of them. I sold the coats, and I remember she was a pastor, and one of her members had passed, and she couldn't even go to the funeral because she didn't have a coat to wear. I stole all of them. Man, what have I become? Auntie is, is gone now. Uh, uh, but that still bothers me. I still, when I pray now, I ask God to forgive me for what I did to A.T. My father took a Greyhound bus from Chicago all the way to Leavenworth to visit me. Uh, when I was at the Cook County Jail, he visited me all the time. Uh, and, and, and I didn't know the effect that I was having on him. Uh, uh, until some years later, because I thought that, okay, I'm not hurting anybody but myself. And I was wrong about that. Uh, I remember hearing when I was sent to the penitentiary, uh, and I heard sometime later was the effect that how it affected my father when he had to go to the jail to get my clothes uh, because I was gone, because I was gone. Uh, and, 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 and what I heard was that uh, the effect it had on him was uh, it was almost like him going to a, a hospital or something to get my clothes because I'm dead. And that was the feeling that he had, that he's, I gotta get my son's clothes, he's gone now. And <clears throat> that had an effect on him that I, 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 I didn't realize till years later. Um, uh, and, and, and even with my daughter, my daughter, uh, uh, when I was uh, arrested, uh, I went to, went to prison and I wrote her a letter uh, because the year previous was the most time I'd ever spent with her when she came to visit in Chicago and I was able to, to be with her and, then, and my son. But I wrote her that letter uh, when I got to the prison and she wrote me back. She said, Dad, why is the only time I hear from you is when you're in jail? Uh, and that affected me because I realized it was true. She lived in Detroit with her mother and, and her uh, other family members, and I lived some everywhere, uh, Chicago, uh, uh, Detroit, uh, uh, St. Louis, California. I was always trying to stay a step ahead of the police and the warrants that I had. And so when I wrote her that and she wrote me back, why well, that's the only time you write me is when you're in jail. That, that, that messed me up. Uh, because it was true. Uh, and so when I'm in prisons, talking to the men in prisons, uh, uh, when I go and I, I, I share that story with them, let them know, no, don't make the same mistakes I made. Uh, the stuff you're doing is not just affecting you, it's affecting your whole family, your children, uh, your little siblings, your brothers or sisters. You, you, are, you are hurting them more than that than you think you are hurting them. Uh, and so, yeah, it was a real negative effect that I had on my family and my friends, even to this day. It was well over $200,000 that I spent during the time of my addiction. Uh, and it might have been even closer to $300,000. Um, I, I had uh, 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 spent so much money on the drug and uh, one thing that I did realize uh, later in my addiction was that even if I wanted a job or wanted to work, I couldn't afford to work because there was no job that was going to pay me enough to be able to uh, supply the drugs that I needed just to function. Um, and so, yeah, it cost a lot uh, monetarily and um, as far as relationships and, and even my freedom. Uh, yeah, drug addiction cost a lot. I was tied to heroin and cocaine. I was addicted to alcohol, cigarettes, sex. Uh, I think I was even addicted to, to crime. Just it was just the, the rush sometimes with the uh, some of the criminal activities that I was doing, the the, the, the con games that I was running, uh, especially when I was uh, in California and in the, in the Marines. It was uh, it, 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 I got a high from that, uh, just being able to 
to uh, talk people out of stuff. Um, all of the males in my family uh, uh, were alcoholics. Uh, my father, uh, my grandfather, uh, all my uncles, uh, uh, cousins, uh, they were all alcoholics. My father was a, was a heavy drinker and alcoholic. I think the only thing that uh, saved him from that was, what, was his call, when God called him to the, to the ministry. Um, uh, and then he got delivered him from that. But uh, I remember was growing up in the child, all I saw was alcoholism, especially from the male, the male side of uh, my family, both sides of the family, my mother's side and my father's side. First high I experienced was a aerosol can. About seven years old. And from there, everything took off. Before junior high, I was probably at a, a stoned alcoholic, drug addict, whatever you want to call it. But it was, it was never addressed because I was the fourth child. I felt my mom played favoritism. Overall, five of us, and I'm okay with that. I was known as the black sheep, so I continued on. Um, before I was 16, I formed my own gang got into the streets and by now crack and everything else was was out there. The first illicit drug I fell in love with was PCP and Angel Dust. And from there on, I spiral out of control. Each time I disconnect from people that's gonna mean me some good, I wind up going back. If you ever, if this is your first treatment, spiritual, whatever type of treatment, each time you go out to you double your dose, you triple your pay. This, this is crack cocaine, seized a few days ago by drug enforcement agents in a park just across the street from the White House. It could easily have been heroin or PCP. It's as innocent looking as candy, but it's turning our cities into battle zones and it's murdering our children. Let there be no mistake. This stuff is poison. We're going to be approaching the area now, a place where back in the day I first started uh, smoking crack. In fact, this is the first place that I was brought to uh, uh, smoke crack at. Uh, crack and also the uh, PCP, what people call water. It's all boarded up now. But that was the place where, where I first started smoking crack. Uh, the uh, PCP, what they call water. The person who I will not name, he had several uh, houses, drug houses in the St. Louis area, but this is where he started. Even when I was on my knees in the alley that night, the alley looked something like this one, on my hands and knees looking for a syringe and a needle that I had thrown away hours earlier. I had thrown them away because I had promised God that I would never shoot drugs again. But here I was in that alley on my hands and knees looking for that, 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 that syringe and that needle. Uh, instead of being on my hands and my knees and asking God to forgive me and to deliver me from this thing. Uh, my marriage failed because I was I, I chose uh, uh, drugs and the lifestyle that I was living over my family. Uh, what I mean by that is that it's, it's, it's the choices that you make. Um, uh, you can choose to, 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 to be with your family and, and, and do what you can to uh, uh, be a father, be a husband, uh, or whatever, or you can choose to um, uh, uh, do what you need to do in order to support your habit. Uh, and if you, uh, the habit that you have, it, it's gonna cost something uh, as far as, 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 as your relationship with folk. Say for instance, um, you might have an appointment to, to go somewhere, to be somewhere at a certain time, um, and you decide before you, when you get ready to leave home to get there, you said, okay, I'm gonna take a hit first before I go, just take the edge off and I'll be good. Okay, but that hit leads to another hit. And then that leads to taking another hit, and that hit leads to taking another hit. And the next thing you know, you've been uh, there getting high and doing drugs instead of going and doing what you're supposed to be doing. And now after taking hit after hit after hit, 
uh, now uh, it, 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 it's so late that uh, it's too late to get there to do what you were supposed to be doing, uh, whether it's supposed to be at one of your kids' ball games or something, or, or, or graduation or whatever. Uh, instead of doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're self-indulging. That's a choice that you have made, and then so your family suffers. Um, I remember a friend of mine, a friend of mine whose mother had passed. Now she loved her mother. Um, her mother had passed, and she had, um, had gotten to the funeral home in plenty of time for the funeral. Matter of fact, she was there for the visitation, and sometimes during the visitation, she decided to step outside, and her and a friend of hers were sitting in the car, and they decided to smoke some crack. And they were sitting there getting high, smoking crack, but the way crack is, uh, one hit leads to another hit, and then to another hit, and to another hit. And before they even realized it, the funeral was halfway over. And they sitting outside in the parking lot, smoking crack, while the mother's, the mother's being funeralized inside. And now, uh, it's not because she didn't love her mother, uh, but the choice that she made uh, was to start, was to take that first hit. And one hit led to another. And so that's an example of, of, of choices that you make that affects your family, or to affect people around you, uh, and even affect you later when you realize, man, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? Mom in there being you, uh, a funeral going on, and I'm about to sit in the car getting high. But by the time you realize that and think about that, it's too late. Look, my daughter was graduating. I was supposed to be at the graduation. And I'm out here getting high or trying to get some money. Other stuff that's going on, you made choices, it's a bad choice. And somewhere down the road, that's going to eat at you and eat you up, consume you. I was trying to escape reality. I lost so much by the decisions that I'd made. We all have dreams. I had, I had dreams when, I was, when I, was, I was a child growing up, and then I started achieving some of those dreams. Uh, like I said, for, it, 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 it went, at one point I was a, a functioning drug addict, but even before I started using the drugs, when I was preaching before, I was a sought after teenage preacher around the Midwest. Uh, that was gone. Uh, I was uh, a, 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 a successful businessman in the retail industry uh, and retail management. I messed that up. Uh, I was uh, an upcoming politician in Chicago uh, working for one of the first black uh, United States congressmen. That was gone. I got in the Marines. I, I made all the way to sergeant in one of the, the, the toughest, most respected uh, branches of the military that there is. I messed that up. God gave me chance and chance after chance, and I was able to achieve this and that, and I messed it all up. I threw it all away because of some choices that I made and the, the addictions that I had. And it was, uh, uh, and I, I, I was sitting, I think back of man. I had it, I had it. And then I would get so discouraged or disgusted because I know those chances, those opportunities, they never were gonna come back. So what am I now? I'm just a junkie. That's all I'm ever gonna be. And I was just another junkie who studied hurting folk and do it. And so you get so depressed off of that. Uh, I heard people say that, that, that people do drugs for two reasons. One is to feel good and the other one is not to feel. When you first start shooting drugs or doing drugs, you're doing it because it makes you feel good. But later on, you're doing it because you don't want to feel. You don't want to feel the pain that you cause to everybody. You don't, you don't want to feel the disappointment that you are having yourself and, and, and how you disappointed other folks. You don't want to feel that. So you medicate. You just keep doing more drugs and drug after drug because you don't want to feel. I get a lot of people, um, who call or contact me because one of their, their, their loved ones, their son, their daughter, or whoever, is strung out on drugs. They know how God delivered me from drugs, so they want me to talk to them. Um, and I, I'm glad to do that. But what people have to realize is that um, uh, uh, they're not, if, they, if they're not ready to, to quit, they're not gonna listen to me. 
because they think that they got it under control. They think they're using because they want to use. Uh, they, you hear people say, um, I can quit any time I want to. I'm just not ready to quit. So until they realize that they are ready to quit and what's going on, they will never quit. But one thing that you that is good uh, is that you're able to plant a seed. And so that's what I do sometimes is I plant a seed. So then, um, uh, just like the Bible says, uh, even about Christianity, one person might plant a seed, another one might water it, but then God gives an increase. If I plant a seed with someone and then some, something else happens down the road uh, to reinforce what I, the seed that I planted, in other words, they watered it. Uh, and then so um, uh, uh, when, when, when time comes, then uh, when, when they, 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 they start feeling like, okay, this, is, this, this ain't what I signed up for. Uh, uh, maybe it's time for me to rethink this thing. But sometimes it might be kind of late because they've lost some stuff. Different people have rock bottoms. Uh, for some, it's going to jail. For some, it's a loss of a loved one. Uh, for one, someone is being, uh, being homeless or whatever. Uh, different people have their own rock bottom. But then when they get close to that bottom, then, then, then it starts sinking in that, okay, this is not what I, what I want. Um, and, and it took a while for me to realize that myself. Um, again, what, uh, what started affecting me was when I saw how I was affecting other folk. But until until I got ready to quit, I don't care who came and talked to me about what, I wasn't hearing it. My cousin, uh, who's passed now, uh, I loved her, Rose, um, she, she had tried to talk because she had, had been been on drugs before herself and, 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 and God had delivered her. So she was trying to help me, but I wasn't trying to hear that at that time. I just wanted to just leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. I quit when I'm ready. I remember uh, early in my addiction, I went to uh, a, a drug house that was in Chicago, um, uh, 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 where they they sold out of a, a window that led to an alley. Uh, you tap on the window and you tell them what they want, what you want, and then they would you to get the bag or two, or whatever you wanted. Uh, uh, I did that one night uh, after getting off work, and I uh, was headed back to my car, and then I saw someone coming up through a vacant lot. Uh, and when I saw them, I didn't know what it was, was a police or what. I dropped the, the bag when I realized what was going on because the person had a gun pointed at me. And he said, okay, give it up. Uh, and I act like I didn't know what he was talking about. He said, I said, what you talking about, man? What, what, what you talking about? He said, uh, uh, give, give me the dope. And I, I started trying to play it off, you know, like I ain't, I ain't got no dope. They, they didn't have any of, you know, or whatever. And he, and he put, the, put the gun closer to me and said, don't, 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 don't make me hurt, don't make me shoot you. Uh, give me the bag. And so after hesitating and, and stuff as long as I could, I saw, okay, this dude look like he's going to shoot me. I dropped the bag on the ground. Uh, and I was, and I, I was hoping that, 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 that at first that he wouldn't see it because I put my foot over it. And so I was still trying to talk to him and tell him that I don't have anything. But when he cocked the gun, see, I told you, I dropped it, it's right there. I was hoping in my mind that he was going to reach down and pick up the bag. And when he did that, I was going to kick him in the head. Uh, he didn't do that. He told me to get, to get in my car. I said, okay. And so I had another plan. I was gonna get in the car, and then I was gonna run over him. But when I got in the car, by the time I looked up, he had vanished into the dark. I drove around looking for him. I know that sounds crazy. He got a gun. I ain't got no gun, but I'm driving around looking for him over a $10 bag of heroin. Um, but that is the, that, 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 that's one of the dangers that you have. And that wasn't the only time that I, that I faced a stick up. There's been several times, but that's one that stands out of my mind. So there are a lot of ways that uh, you can, that you're risking your life when you, when you are doing drugs. One is overdosing, the other one is just being, being robbed or shot or, 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 or getting killed in a drug situation. My father uh, was never able to see me uh, the new me or the real me or the delivered me, the one after Christ delivered me from my, my, my addiction. Uh, my father never gave up on me. He, he, as I said, stated earlier, when I was going through all of this stuff, my father was always with me. 
a disappointment dad really had was when I was really getting to my worst one time. And I, 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 I got to my father's house and I knocked, I rung the bell. Dad lifted the curtain. Normally when he lifts the curtain, you see me, he opens, swings the door, and hey, here's, my, here's my son, come on in here, boy, you know. But that time, Dad lifted the curtain and was just looking at me. He said, what you want? I said, Dad, it's me. He said, I know who you are, what you want? <laughs> and I can tell then that Dad was really, really, really disappointed in me. But even then, he couldn't hold it that long. Dad loved me. Uh, and, 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 and even though he didn't live to see the change in me, I know it's because of the prayers that he prayed constantly on my behalf was one of the reasons that, that I am who I am now. He was uh, always trying to rid the neighborhood of the drug activity and the drugs. Dad was uh, uh, um, uh, the kind of person, he would, he would go and talk to folk. He, everybody in the neighborhood knew who Reverend Barr was. And, and, and when, when people were, the, the drugs were going on, he'd go try to talk to them. He was trying to get the drugs out of the neighborhood. And one Saturday, uh, I remember that uh, um, Daddy called me, uh, and we had talked for a while, and then he said he was going to, to the grocery store to get his groceries. Asked him, did he want, did, asked him, did he want me to drive him to the store? He said, no, nah, man, you know, that's how I get my exercise. And so we hung up. Uh, a little bit later, I was on my way to get some drugs. Uh, I, I didn't. I, I didn't drive. I took the bus because I didn't want Aunt T to know I was standing with Aunt T, and I didn't want her to know that I was gone because she would would figure I was going to get drugs. But anyway, I saw a crowd that was gathered around right there on the corner of where Dad lived, where I grew up from. Grew up at. I got back to the house. Then later on, someone came over and told me, said, "Hey man, you better get get over to the house." Uh, Robin Barr was, he just ran over, uh, hit by a car, and he don't look good. Uh, and what happened was, uh, witnesses say that when Dad was crossing the street with his groceries, someone intentionally ran over him. They pulled out, like, almost like you see on movies and stuff, they were sitting there when Dad crossed the street, they pulled out and, and, and floored the car and ran over him. Uh, <clears throat> he was, uh, in the hospital in a coma for about three days uh, before he passed away, but yeah, that's what happened. Uh, uh, people think it was some of the same drug dealers or uh, the dad was trying to talk to and trying to um, get them to change their life that they, I guess they felt like he was um, interfering with their business and so they ran him down and killed him. I was never at the point where I didn't want to live anymore, but I had gotten to the point where I knew that if I kept going uh, the way I was going and that well, the things that I was doing, I, I, could, I, I could end up dying. Uh, and, and the thing was, I didn't care. Uh, it's not that I didn't want to live, but I didn't care if I died, if that makes any sense. When I was in Cook County Jail in Chicago, uh, even though I was in jail, I longed for time to get out of there so I can get back to my regular activities of, of, of getting high. Uh, but it was this one particular, one particular Sunday, it was a, 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 a prison ministry preacher that came through the, the jail. Uh, his name was Reverend Jerry Hodges in Chicago. Um, I was standing there in the cell block, well, in the, in the uh, outer area of the cell, and, and he came up behind me and he, he said, hey, my brother, why don't you come on down to the Bible study? God's got a word for you. And I went down to the, I, I really didn't, didn't care about going, but I have nothing else to do, so I sat in the back of the, of the uh, uh, church service, and when Reverend Hodges was talking, uh, he had said something that got my attention. That was, as I said before, I was, I was wondering how come I keep going to jail. Like when you asked the question about how many times I had been arrested, and I was saying, why well, I keep going to jail? There was a time that I used to get away with all this stuff. Now I'm getting, I'm getting arrested for everything now. For stuff that my friends are getting away with, I'm going to jail for it. Why I keep going to jail? And he asked that question. Said he said, no, he said, made a statement. He said, I bet a lot of y'all wonder why you're here in this jail. 
So I started listening to see the reason that a lot of y'all in here is because when you were running the street doing your thing, God couldn't get your attention. You couldn't hear him. So sometimes what he does is he allows you to be put someplace to slow you down so you can hear him. And he does that because he loves you. And what you got to remember is that no matter what you've done or no matter what you become, God still loves you. And that was the beginning of my turnaround because I'd always thought that I had done too much wrong for God to ever forgive me. I'd hurt too many people. I got too many people strung out on drugs. Some of the women who were, who were prostituting was, and I blamed that on myself because I got them strung out. Now they, they, they are strung out and they're prostituting because I got them strung out. It's a folk who had OD'd and died because I started them on drugs. So I'd done too much wrong for God to forgive me. But remember how I just said, no matter what you've done, God still loves you. That was the beginning of my turnaround. That's what did it. I surround myself with people who hold me accountable. Uh, Dr. Ronald Bobo, the pastor of this church, who's my pastor, has been my pastor for 23, 25, 20 some years. Uh, uh, one of the people who holds me accountable. He knows my life, he knows my story, he knows everything about me. Uh, he's the one that put me to, over the prison ministry. Uh, it was some times that, I, that I, I, I got weak and slipped for one reason or another, like when my, uh, when my mother passed. Uh, and I was falling into uh, into some stuff that I that was going to have me going back to that uh, lifestyle. And he had his arm around me, let him, let me know that no, you ain't got to do that. I got you. And not just him, other folk in the church here. And so you got to surround yourself with people, with positive people who got your back. And. They're not always going to tell you stuff you want to hear, but they tell you stuff you need to hear. And you got to be able to accept that and listen to it. That's what keeps me going. My pastor and my church, church family and my family as well. My niece, Christine, my cousin, Patrice, they, those kind of people I need to be around. Because I was saying, when I left Chicago, when I, when I left Chicago, I wanted, I love to get away from that lifestyle. <clears throat> uh, growing up, I, I'd always heard my parents say, stay away from so-and-so, don't go around so-and-so. I had gotten to be so-and-so, what people were telling their children to stay away from, stay away from Bub, stay away from Barr, stay away from him. You, you don't want to end up like him, stay away from him. Uh, and I was that person that everybody was telling the kids to stay away from. Uh, and so when I decided, no, it's time for me to, to leave, I knew that the only way was to get out of, the, not just out of the neighborhood. I, had, I left Chicago. I came to St. Louis. The thing is, there are drugs in St. Louis, too. So that wasn't going to solve the problem just leaving St. Louis. I had to leave the kind of people, because the same kind of people were here the ones in St. Louis. Uh, in Chicago, rather, but uh, uh, when I got here, I didn't seek them out. And when I and, and, and when that element came toward me, no, I I didn't fall into that trap here. Uh, even before I got into church, and when I got into church, and Pastor Bobo heard my testimony, uh, people accepted me. People expected something from me. My friend Ron Cohen, he was, uh, he's, 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 he, he was a, a professional drug counselor. And, 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 and it was sometimes, you know, like when I started drinking, because when my mother, when I was going through the stuff with my mother, I, I, I blamed my mother's death on myself. Um, and, and, and he, and he uh, held me accountable. He talked, and, 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 and it was other folk uh, from the church uh, when I started straying away at one, at one point, I kind of disappeared, and they wouldn't let me do that. 
If I if they didn't see me at church after a few weeks, they were in my house, or they were calling me. Man, you all right? Okay, that's what I'm talking about. You got to be the people who care about you. And I found a and and and, and this is what works for me. You got to find what works for you. So as the saying goes, different strokes for different folks. This is this is what worked for me. This is my stroke. Whether you're talking about in the 12-step movement or churches, you don't not you don't do this by yourself. You always have people that are like-minded uh, around you, so you have support. Um, you have an accountability partner. James 5.16 says, confess your faults one to another. Let yourself be open to somebody and say, look, I'm struggling right now. But that, let that person be not somebody who's going to co-sign your insanity, but somebody who's going to support you and strengthen you and, and tell you to hold on and pray for you. Uh, for those people who are, are, are tempted to try it, uh, I would only say that that um, the devil, the devil, uh, that that getting out of something always costs more than getting into something. Uh, you know, you certainly there are people who can have have a couple drinks and stop. There are people who can smoke one joint or blunt or whatever the terminology is and stop. Um, but there's also people who, once they start trying something, uh, they're hooked. Uh, and you don't know which one you are. You won't know which one you are until it's too late. The drug issues didn't come about until uh, later on in life. And when we first met each other, I don't believe he was in drugs at all. I believe it was after the 35 years of not seeing each other and not communicating with each other that his life took a spin. And when he told me about it, uh, I was a little taken aback because I was like a little afraid at first, but I started listening to him and I did have true compassion for him. I was, uh, before I, I, I left Chicago, I remember it was in November of uh, 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 1991, uh, I was on my way to a drug house on, uh, in Chicago one Sunday morning, and uh, I went and bought a bag of heroin, a bag of cocaine, and I was, uh, it was a church uh, that was across the street from the drug house. Matter of fact, there were two churches uh, right there uh, on that corner. And I remember walking back past the uh, church uh, with the drugs. It was a little, it was drizzling then, it was light rain. Uh, and it was a sermon that was being preached inside, inside the church. The door was open, I don't know why, uh, uh, but uh, I can hear parts of the sermon. I can hear the sermon was being preached. It was about the prodigal son. Uh, and, and the sermon, it was getting to me. I, I, knew, I knew the story because I, I preached that sermon myself uh, several times, you know, before I left the church. Uh, uh, and, and, and so, but anyway, it, it was different then. And I, I, I sat there, it was raining now, but, and I had drugs in my hand, heroin and cocaine, and I sat on the steps listening to the, listening to the sermon, and it, it hit me. And I, 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 I was saying, Lord, uh, I'm so sorry for the life I've been living. Please forgive me uh, for the life I've been living. And I, I threw the drugs away. Uh, and I walked away uh, from the drugs. And I never went, well, I can't say I never went back because a month later uh, I'd relapsed. Uh, but, but that was, that was when I, I quit. Um, I remember I was telling you about Reverend Hodges, this was in 85, and I told you before about how sometimes someone plants a seed and then later on it's, it's watered. Even though Reverend Hodges planted that seed back in 1985, it wasn't until 1991 uh, when I was going through this this, this real uh, back end of my drug addiction that it, it really hit home. And then it capped off by hearing that sermon in the rain that Sunday morning. And then that was when I, I, I decided, no, uh, I, I can't do this anymore. And so I quit. 
My faith in God, God is the one that uh, delivered me from the drugs in the first place. It wasn't me. It was God who delivered me. So uh, I, I trust in him to, to um, uh, get me over any rough spots in life that I'm going through. But then again, it is surrounding yourself with people who uh, who will hold you accountable, people who, who love you. When I messed up, I slipped back the first time because uh, I, was, I was clean for maybe a month. And I, I was thinking that I could... Uh, go and be around the same folks that I used to hang out with, uh, it wouldn't affect me. Not true. I remember when I was taking uh, flute lessons when I was living in San Diego, I, I, I was a jazz fan. I, I, I wanted to play like Herbie Mann and Hubert Laws and Youssef Latif. Uh, and I started taking flute lessons uh, every Saturday. Uh, after a couple of weeks of lessons, uh, I remember uh, on one of Herbie Mann's albums, it was a picture of him playing the flute. And he, his hands, his fingers were going way up and down, way up and down. And so when I was uh, 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 taking that lesson, I was doing the same thing. My fingers were going way up off of the, uh, off of the, the keys. And my teacher told me, you can't do that. You got to have your fingers right, right on the keys and just play them like that. But I was saying, but Herbie Mann, now, I saw a picture of Herbie Mann. Now, his fingers were way up on the thing. He said, no, you have to have your fingers close. Now, I wanted to do like Herbie Mann, but like the thing was, Herbie Mann been playing, was playing flute for decades. I was playing for a week or two. So, the point I'm trying to say is, I couldn't do the same stuff he was doing because he was experienced at it and had been doing it for a while, so he can let his fingers fly around. I'm just starting this thing. So it's the same thing with someone who is, is, is trying to be drug-free. What happened was, okay, I've been clean for a month, and I thought that I can go around folk who, who's still using it. It won't affect me. No, it don't happen that way. I can now because I've been, I've been clean for decades. But back then, I've been clean for a week or two. And so, no, surround yourself with, with, with folk who... Um, if you're not living in that lifestyle, you have a better chance of being successful in your recovery. You know, when you, when you grow up in the streets, or been in the streets for so long, that's what you know. And then to come out of that, it's almost like a whole new world. Like, what? Uh, you know, and, and then those old insecurities kick in, and then we try to, to cope because we cope with drugs. You know, that, that was our coping mechanism, you know. So whenever, because as long as we live, it's going to be problems. It's going to be disappointments. It's going to be uh, valid, you know. And the way we used to cope with it was to go and use, you know. But God gives us another alternative, you know, a better alternative. The 121st Psalm, uh, I remember when I was deep in my addiction, my father, one day he, he, he told me to read that scripture uh, every day. And, and, and I did, it was 121st Psalm. I would lift up my eyes to the hills and would count my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth and, and, and going on. And I remember every morning before I, I, I would uh, go to do anything, my Bible was always on the dresser and it was open to that scripture. Um, and, and, and I remember a couple of times, there was friends of mine who would come up and go in my room, we get ready to shoot up, get high, and they, and they, was, they wanted to close the Bible. No, don't touch the Bible, leave the Bible open right there, you know, because um, that was just a thing. It was something my father, I, I felt like my father gave me that. And so that was, that's, 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 that was, that's my scripture. Uh, 121st Psalm. And I remember when I was in the prison, and I forgot which one I was in, I think it was Centralia. Um, it, was, it, was, it was after I had, uh, it was after my experience with Reverend Hodges. And I was walking, uh, uh, I was walking around the, the prison yard one day by myself and I was praying. And I, I heard, I heard, I heard the voice of God clearer, or as clear as I've ever heard him. He said, just like I sent Reverend Hodges into the prison to rescue you, I'm going to send you back into the prison to rescue my other children. And at that time, I wasn't preaching. I was still in prison myself. Uh, but he said that. And so I wasn't feeling it because I wasn't even understanding it because I wasn't a preacher. Uh, I wasn't even back in church, for real. I mean, not on the outside anyway. 
but then uh, that's what happened. And being clean, um, I, I'm able to do stuff. I, I'm able to help people. Um, I, I'm able to help other folks who are, are going through the same stuff that I went through. Uh, I can help them to get past their addictions. I can uh, uh, give them uh, advice. Uh, um, uh, uh, a lot of times what people need when they come out of prison, not, the reason a lot of people are in jail and prison is because of their drug addiction. A lot of them are not really, they're not bad people. They, they, they did some dumb stuff because they were addicted. And so if we can help them get past that point, then we can help them do a lot of other things in life. My biggest regret is uh, the hurt and the pain that I caused my family, uh, that I was always going to jail. My family had so, so, much, so much hope for me, um, and I disappointed them. At first, when I was doing, doing criminal stuff, I, was, I called myself Nickel Slick. You know, I was able to talk folk out of stuff. Uh, but when it came down toward the edge, toward the end, uh, the way that I used to make money by, by, by ripping off uh, 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 other drug dealers and, and ripping off uh, banks and stores and doing all of that, that was fine. I got to a point where I wasn't making money off of the dealers anymore. I wasn't ripping off the, the, uh, 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 the banks or the stores or the businesses and all of that anymore. I was ripping off my people, my family. Uh, my, 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 the church, my, my, my father's church, my aunt's church, that there was, and, and, and that was, no, that was something that was, uh, that before, a long time ago, would have been unacceptable. Um, uh, I was no longer that, that, that slick talking come, and I was just a, 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 a drug, a, a dope fiend who would steal anything from anybody uh, to support my habit. And looking back on that, uh, that was the beginning of where I said, okay, this has gone too far. That was my rock bottom when I started, when I was dealing from family the way I was and I was hurting family the way I was. That I couldn't, that was unacceptable to me. I, I never stopped believing, stopped believing in God. Uh, uh, and, and I know that um, looking back on things that, uh, stuff that I thought uh, that I was able to accomplish even during those times. A case in point, uh, when I was in prison, uh, it was a lot of, a lot of guys that were getting messed over, messed up, people getting, people getting shanked, people getting raped, people, stuff was happening to folk. But nothing ever happened to me. And I thought it was because of the way I carried myself. I thought I was carrying myself with error. Okay, don't mess with me. But thinking back on it, I, I, I realized it was God had his hand on me. It, it wasn't how I carried myself or what I was doing. It had nothing to do with that. Nothing happened to me because God had his hand on me. Uh, because it was guys that were bigger, tougher, stronger than I was who was getting messed up. But nothing happened to me. And it wasn't because of me, it was because of God. I was heard of last December, December 5th, uh, working for St. Louis City Refuge, uh, South City over here, and uh, I contracted blood poisoning. The next 24 hours, I was crushed by a 500-yard waste dumpster and uh, it lacerated three fingers, broke my shoulder, my knee, my ankle, and so on. I wind up uh, self-medicating while I was on the job going through uh, uh, rehab for the injury and it was so gratifying to bring the new year in and I couldn't even wipe my own backside. One hand was, was infected with blood poison and the other three fingers had been sewed on. But uh, you would think that was God's way of telling me to slow down. I never did. I walked away from my job with the city. I walked away from a house, a good woman who held me up and held me down but she didn't deserve what I gave her. Each time I would revisit those demons, I would bring those demons into her, her life as well, which she deserved better. I don't miss anything about your life. Uh, that was uh, a life that I thought 
that I liked or I was enjoying while I was doing it, but looking back on it, uh, that was, no, there's nothing that I miss about that. Uh, I do miss some of the, 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 the people that I was associating with, some of my friends at the time. Uh, I think about some of them from, from time to time, uh, but I knew that if I really wanted to stay away from that lifestyle and get away from the drugs and get away from that, I had to separate myself from them. And that's why I, I, I left and I, 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 I stayed away from them and that whole lifestyle. Uh, a lot of them I haven't seen for over 20 years. Uh, my friend Red, uh, the first person I was ever first arrested with, they found him in a hotel a hotel room with his throat cut. Um, and then there was uh, Butch, a friend of mine that I grew up with. Uh, he, uh, we used to get, get high together. Uh, he overdosed. Uh, and they found him uh, dead from a, from a drug overdose. Uh, my friend Fuzzy, uh, 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 Fuzzy uh, was a longtime friend. As a matter of fact, I'm the one who started him to shooting heroin and cocaine. Uh, just like Tapo started me, I started Fuzzy. I'm, Tapo was the first one stuck a needle in my arm. I'm the one, first one stuck a needle in Fuzzy's arm. Um, and I found out that I heard one day that uh, 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 Fuzzy grandmother found him uh, in his bedroom laying on the floor dead with a needle in his arm uh, that 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 hurt it a lot uh, when I, I found out about my friend fuzzy uh, but that's the that's the dangers of, of the drug life uh, uh, there are others that that I've heard about uh, that they're doing quite well now um, uh, one was my my friend uh, tadpole um, uh, as I said before, Tapo was one that first I stuck in the mom, and we, we got high together for years. And it was on one of my visits to Chicago that um, uh, I was talking to Tapo, and I was able to lead him to Christ. Uh, sometime later, Tapo gave up the drugs, even after 20, 30 some years of doing drugs, he, had, uh, 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 he was delivered from that lifestyle. Uh, and he was clean for uh, well over 15 years. Um, before he passed. He died last year. Um, I preached his funeral, but at least I know that uh, 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 he had better quality of life during, during all of that time. I was arrested when I, I went to jail one time, and I said, man, I am so tired of going to jail. I am tired of going to jail. And then I said, I wonder how many times have I been locked up? And I started counting, and I started counting. And I started counting it. When I got to 30, I stopped counting. I got depressed when I got to 30. And I wasn't finished because I still had some over. I just quit counting. And I said, I don't know how many times I've been arrested. I don't know. I know it was more than 30. <laughs> and I remember even now, when I'm doing prison ministry, it was one of, the, one of the prisons that I was putting an application to go to to do ministry. And I filled out an application, and then when they did the background check on me, they came, it came, they called me in to say they had to deny my application because I didn't list all of my arrests on the application. I said, I don't know of all my arrests. Most of the time, I was high when I got arrested. I didn't even know I was arrested. <laughs> I, I don't know. So, and you answer your question, I've been arrested more, over 30 times. I've been, been to prison three times, or twice I was sentenced, and one was on a parole violation. Uh, but when you ask how many times I've been arrested, all I could say was more than 30. Uh, a guy might tell you to go in, one, in a certain direction and you say, I don't know about that, you know, but you have to trust him. Uh, example, when I was in the Marines, I played, played football. The quarterback would call the play and then uh, I was supposed to be running down the field and I had blockers. I had blockers who was who was supposed to be blocking for me, but the play was I was supposed to go to the right, and and when I get ready to go to the right, I look up and I see all the folk up there. I said, Nah, I don't want to go that way. That don't look good. So I'm going the other way. But the play was called for me to go to the right, so all the blockers are set up to block on the right. But I don't like what I'm seeing on the right, so it looked better down to the left. So I'm going to the left. And that's what happens with us sometimes. God uh, uh, has a, 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 a plan for us to go one way, but we don't like what we see uh, that way. So no, we want to, oh, I want to do that. I'm going this way. So, but you got to trust God. 
uh, that he knows what's happening. He told you to go that way because he knows what's, what's over there. It, the, oh, that looks all right right now. But when you get over there, then there's something over there that, 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 that you don't want to get involved in or you don't want happening. So trust God and go the way he told you to go. Taking on a heroin addiction, fentanyl addiction, with a crack addiction and everything else. I told a girl that I was getting high with, nothing sexual. I told her she could leave. A friend of mine gave me a, a loaded gun. As God would have it, my little brother opened up the door and he intervened. Let me do what I did with the drugs, finish the rest of the liquor and the crack and heroin and fentanyl, and tricked me into his truck. Proceeded to go to St. Mary's. He sat on the parking lot to see if I was gonna leave, which after they took me to the back, I felt a calm. But I got, I guess I got out of control once I got back there. And I told the lady, if she let me, they let me out of there in the next 24 hours. I was gonna end my life. And uh, they transported me to DePaul Hospital. And uh, I was bound in a straitjacket for a day and a half on my knees praying. If I got another chance that I would go somewhere, I wasn't gonna take my life and I wasn't going back to that misery and that storm. Some of the decisions I made took me out of God's will at that point in time, but never out of his reach. I've been clean 86 days by the grace of God. This is the longest I've been sober in five years. Some of these guys, I love them. Some of them I'm never gonna see again, but without any of these guys, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at. For those who are not able to beat their addictions, uh, there are one of several places that they'll end up. Uh, they'll end up in, in prison or they will end up uh, dead an early death. One thing my father used to say was everything that feels good to you is not good for you. And that's an advice that you should, that, that, that I would give to a 20 year old person. Just cause that the drug feels good, it, it feel, the high feels good, that doesn't mean that, or, or, or the drink tastes good, that doesn't mean it's good for you. Later on down the road, you're gonna pay for it. A lot of times we think that everything is about us, but it's not. Uh, it's about God. God is the one who delivered me. That's why there's a lot of stuff that, that God allowed me to go through because he saw the other side of it. When I was going through it, it was painful. I didn't like it. Uh, well, I didn't like the outcome anyway. But where I am now, I'm able to, to walk in my purpose and to help folk. And that's what God put me here for. And yes, he gets all the praise, honor, and the glory because of what he has done through me. Trying to, trying to stay clean is, is, is not as is, is always as easy as, as someone thinks it is. Sometimes you're gonna have relapse. You have relapses. But like my father used to, used, my father, I heard him say one time, son, if you slip and fall in the mud, don't just lay down wild in it. Get up, clean yourself off, and keep on stepping. If you fall down again, get up again. If you fall down again, get up again. If you keep falling down, keep getting up. And that's the message I want to give to folk who are, are trying to get clean or stay clean. Just because they relapse and fall, fall back or something, then don't give up, you know, and say, okay, I can't do this. No, just get up, clean yourself off, and keep on stepping. If you fall down again, get up again. If you fall down again, get up again. If you keep falling down, keep getting up. My rock bottom was um, in uh, December of 92, I became homeless, living on the street, going from shelter to shelter. And uh, so from 2003 to now, I've been using the scriptures as my standard for living. And I believe the Lord has let me see recovery throughout the scriptures. So. I've been, whether it was in the meetings or in the churches I belonged to, I was always serving in one ca capacity or another. Service, um, to me, uh, is, a, is a tangible expression of, of your gratitude. Uh, and uh, one of the cliches that you'll hear if you stay around the 12-step movement is that uh, a grateful addict will never use. I got clean at the age of 45. You know, at 45, you, you, I, I just felt that um, 
for the most part, most of us have lived more than half of our lives. And just the, the fear of going back out there kept me doing what I was supposed to That's one of the things that kept me doing what I was supposed to do. And then uh, my lifestyle changed in terms of what I was doing, who I did it with, and where I did it, the people, places, and things. So um, those are all key components of, of uh, staying clean. And then, uh, of course, you're tempted. Uh, that's when prayer works. Prayer can, prayer works, because the, the evil one will, will get you. Uh, he's always after you, but he'll jump on you when you least expect it. And that's when you call on scripture. That's when you call on the literature. Um, that's when you just hold on tight and say, I'm not going to use today. Uh, because the, 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 the urge does subside. The urge does uh, lessen. Uh, the disease of addiction would have you act on your urge immediately. So uh, if you can defer that, then you can get it back under under arrest, as they say. Sitting in the jail cells in the Cook County Jail or in Leavenworth or at uh, Centralia or in Joliet, I, I never thought that, that, that a day like this would, would, would come. Uh, uh, but, but, but I thank God that uh, uh, how, he has, how far he has brought me. I hurt a lot of people. Uh, I, 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 I disappointed a lot of people. There are consequences to your decisions. And one day, sooner or later, you got to face the consequences to every decision, every choice you make. Because the Bible is full of stories of people who uh, have messed up, uh, but God never gave up on them. Uh, the heroes in the Bible, Peter, uh, Paul, uh, 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 even Jonah, you know, who ran away from, from uh, what God wanted them to do. Um, David, uh, they've all done things that were contrary to God's will. You know, but God still loved them, and God used them in a special way. Um, and 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 a lot of the the, the people that I know of, not everyone, uh, uh, have gone through some adversity. And, and and if you learn from that adversity, no matter what it was, whether it's jail or prison, whether it's drugs or alcohol, uh, whether it's it, 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 it's uh, uh, some other uh, a form of uh, of addiction or whatever. Uh, if you learn from that and you're able to uh, reach others and to help them uh, uh, recover from whatever it is that they're going through, um, then uh, you've done, in my opinion, what uh, you were supposed to do. You see, it's easy to uh, praise God when you're up and things are going all right, but God wants to know if you will praise Him when you're down, when things are not going right, when you are hungry, when you, you're going through one situation or another. He wants to know if you will still praise Him even in that situation. He wants to know that, that, that you will do what He wants you to do. And then, uh, even in that situation, we have to lift up our hands. It is not going to be easy all the time. It's not going to be easy. God didn't promise us that things would be easy, but he promised us that he would be with us and he would hold us up. He would hold our hands and he would carry us through. You see, we can't do it on our own. Every time I tried to do this thing on my own, I messed up. But it wasn't until I put myself uh, in God's hands that things got to be a little bit easier. And he carried me through. Uh, times still get rough sometimes, but he is still carrying me. I'm not doing this on my own. And I'm telling whoever I'm talking to out here, you can do it too if you trust God. Stop trying to do it on your own. Trust in God. He is the one that can carry you across the finishing line. You can't do it on your own. You have to trust God and be with him and be the man, be the woman, be the child that God wants you to be. And then, my friends, my brothers and my sisters, you will be successful and God will get the glory from your life. And I was thinking back over my life. There's anything that I would have changed if I could. And suddenly thinking about it, I says, no. Even all the heartache and pain that I went through, I, I wouldn't change that. The time I spent in jails and in prison, I, I wouldn't change that. Not saying I enjoyed it because I didn't. But I wouldn't change it because all of that made me who I am now. And being who 
who I am and all the stuff that I went through, I, I'm able to be a blessing to the other folks. Yes. Yeah. People who I wouldn't be able to reach, people who wouldn't listen to me unless they realize that I've been through what they are going through. Good. When I go into the prison, they know that when I talk, I'm not just talking about some stuff that I read in the book or somewhere. No, I'm talking about stuff that I lived. And if I can make it, you can make it too. God is no respecter of person. He don't, he, 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 he don't look like me or love me no more than he loves you or no more than he loves you. Your testimony touched me, bro. So did yours. And all the ones that I heard too, yours over there. Northside. <laughs> Anytime you do drugs or, or, or something, you are, you are uh, risking your life. Because you never know uh, whether you're going to overdose. You, you never know whether you're going to get uh, 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 murdered or killed when you're going in and out of the drug house, at the drug house, or leaving from the drug house. You never know what's going to happen. So in reality, uh, uh, every time could be your last time. Hi, everyone. This is Shay. And the question of the day is, what does it take to survive or overcome obstacles? Dream, drive, and support. So, um... First, you think of what you want to do with your life, and I know at our age, because I'm 16, and right now I know my dream is to become a great performer. Fame's not that important, money's not that important, but I just want to become such a good performer that affects somebody with my talent and change the world in some way, shape, or form, even if it's just a little bit, it's just a little bit that counts. I was asked recently, what would I say to someone who um, uh, who was going to do drugs that night and it ended up being the last time, uh, what, what, what would I say to them? And I'm not arrogant enough to, to think that, 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 that what I can say will change the situation. I, I don't know. Um, uh, I, I don't know what I can tell someone uh, who doesn't know me. Um, uh, 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 not to do this or, or, or not to keep taking chances, chances with their life. I would ask that person if I can pray with them. Now, you notice I didn't say pray for them. I said pray with them. And that is, uh, and while I'm, I'm praying, uh, is that I would pray for his or her safety and for him or her to make uh, good choices. Um, and, and I hope Hopefully, God will lead me to say something in that prayer that they will hear and it will prick or touch their heart to give them second thoughts about what they are about to do. Uh, because whatever I say, nothing I say that comes from me is going to help any situation. I have to trust God that he will say something through me or give me something to say to reach that person or to change that person's mind or at least give them pause to say, huh, maybe I shouldn't do that tonight. And then trust God to do what he does. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for uh, this time and this, 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 this um, uh, uh, time together, and Lord, for the reason and the purpose for uh, this documentary. Uh, Lord, I, I pray, Lord, for all of those who are uh, going through addictions right now, whether it's uh, or because of uh, drugs or, or heroin or cocaine or, or, or crack or, 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 or prescription pills, whatever the addiction is, uh, marijuana. Lord, I, I please deliver them from their addictions. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, let something that was said here, Lord, cause them uh, pause to, to think. Uh, to rethink of what they are doing and let them know that, okay, Lord, that uh, there's a, another way, there's a, there's a better way. Um, they might be hurting for one reason or another, Lord, ease their pain. Uh, they might be going through a difficult situation, whatever it is, Lord, see them through it. And let them know, Lord, that they are not just affecting that their own lives, that, Lord, they are affecting those who love them. And, Lord, I pray, Lord, for those uh, people who... Um, uh, 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 who are living with or who are related to, Lord, people who are addicted. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you will give them uh, patience, Lord, uh, that you will give them uh, uh, wisdom of what to do and what not to do and what to say and what not to say. And they will not be, be enablers, Lord, to those who are addicted, uh, even though they won't enable them, but they will still love them. 
uh, and let them know, Lord, that uh, uh, let the let the person that is addicted know that their loved one really loves them, and that they really want to see and do what is best for them. Lord, I just thank you for this time. Lord, I praise you and I bless you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. One twenty one Overcoming Drug Addiction by Faith by Reverend Burton Barr Jr. Audiobook available on Audible and iTunes. Paperback and ebook available on Amazon.com.